Finland, Europe's northern reaches. Here lie the secrets of seafaring history, but only few know where to find them. No one in Europe likes to sweat as much as the Finns do, occasionally even in the mobile sauna. In the islands close to Turku, Dr. Jana Kastrin pays household calls by boat. In the Skerries, he is the only doctor far and wide. The route begins between Sweden and Finland and continues to Vasa. From there, it follows the coast across the Skerries to Helsinki. For 90 years now, Logshare Lighthouse has guided ships over the Equus rocks in the Gulf of Bothnia to the safe shores of the Orlands. Meanwhile, it has been automated. When the last lighthouse keeper moved out, bird watchers moved in. Off the shores of Orland, the traffic density of ferries is remarkable. The islands have a special status in Finland. Although they are part of the EU, you can shop tax-free aboard the ships. In Mariham Harbour lies the only original foremast in the world, the Poman, built in 1903. Although the Orland Islands are larger than Berlin and Paris put together, they don't count more than 30,000 residents. One of them lives here, diver Christian Ekström. One of the largest ship graveyards of the Baltic Sea is right on his doorstep. In one of the wrecks, Christian found a French treasure, which he now plans to retrieve together with his diver friends. More than 150-year-old champagne, the oldest in the world, that is still drinkable. It tastes like nutmeg, very sweet and not like the champagne we have nowadays. But it has a real good quality and simply tastes fantastic nonetheless. It's not like you get a phone call like this every day and somebody tells you he has found an old champagne. Right at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. At first everyone thought we were telling them stories. But when the media interest grew bigger and bigger, they had to realize it wasn't a fairy tale we were telling them. 168 bottles of champagne have survived. Each one is worth more than 10,000 euros. From Mariham, we continue northwards, across the Gulf of Bothnia to Vasa. During the last ice age, a huge glacier covered the land. The weight of the ice pushed down on the land. After the big melt, the ground is still recovering from this enormous load until today. Each year, it rises by a few millimetres. New land masses emerge from the sea, some as big as a hundred football fields put together. The hovercraft of the Coast Guard races through the scary landscape with a horsepower of 350. The boats are as mobile on water as they are on ice or sand and always fast, up to 90 kilometers per hour. My vehicle fleet alone makes my job a very special one. I think that many people envy me because of that. It was always Mayu Meki Koyola's dream to live by the sea. For 10 years now, she's been working here at the border. 
I couldn't stand a monotonous nine to five. Right here I found work which is not only varied, but I also get to work in nature. The Finns purchased ten hovercrafts from a specialist company in England. Thanks to the air cushion, Mayo can float onto any of the islands without needing a landing pier. After every outing, she checks the rubber apron, which gets pumped up into a ring again before setting off next time. On the inflating air cushion, the boat takes off, powered by a propeller at the back of the vehicle. The best part is when the cushion gets pumped up and the boat slides down the ramp and it floats. The first time I rode along, I thought it would never keep itself afloat and that it would simply sink. In Europe, only about 100 people have a license to pilot a hovercraft. The extra training takes one year. The propeller allows Maya to accelerate. The three rudder blades behind it are in charge of the steering. The boat has no brake. In order to stop, Maya has to turn the vessel into the opposite direction. For safety reasons, Maya is always accompanied by a colleague. Steering a hovercraft is much more difficult than navigating a normal boat. It feels like driving a car on icy roads. Once a week, Mayu takes water samples for the Metrological Institute. With the help of a testing probe, she measures the ocean salinity and the water temperature at different places in the Baltic Sea. The water off the coasts of Finland has a very low salt content compared with that in other parts of the world. Minor evaporation and the steady inflow of fresh water from rivers and lakes make the water less salty. In the north of the Gulf of Bothnia, even freshwater fish splash about in the water. Today, Mayu has to cut her measurements short. A radio signal has just come in. A man who went fishing on an island lost his boat. It drifted off. This is also one of Mayu's and her colleagues' responsibilities. The hovercraft is perfect for missions which operate off-coast and where it's often too flat for ships or patrol boats. We can land directly ashore. Even sharp stones can't harm the air cushion. Hello. Hey. Hi. Did you call for us? Yes, my boat is gone. Thank God you're here. Of course, climb aboard. There are days where you do nothing but enjoy the sea, just like today. It is simply nice and a great feeling to be out here. But if you have to set out during bad weather and in stormy sea, this job can also get very nasty. The bridge between Reiplod and Vasa. Thousands of islands in Finland get by without bridges, but here the ferry service was replaced and the country's longest chain bridge was built for 25 million euros. It is a thousand meters long, for no more than 2,100 islanders. 
That means half a metre of bridge for each of them. Vasa, with a population of 60,000, it is a big city by Finnish standards. As recently as 150 years ago, the church of Korsholm was a court baron and the former centre of the city of Vasa. Today, the centre is situated seven kilometres close to the Baltic Sea. The only thing that remained was this church. The journey continued southwards from Vasa along the coast across Kaskinen to Pori. South of Vasa, there is fertile farmland thanks to a meteorite that hit over 500 million years ago. The meteorite left a crater nearly seven kilometres wide. It's soon filled with dead plants and organisms, which in turn have helped develop the nutrient-rich ground there is today. Just about three quarters of the Finnish population live in cities. The rest is used to having a lot of space. So much solitude can have a melancholic effect. And melancholy is the prime ingredient of an Argentinian dance. The Finns dance it as well, but mostly in a minor key. For 100 years, it has been their national dance, the tango. When you dance the tango, you forget about all your worries. Any stress you've had during the day doesn't matter anymore. The tango gives you strength for body and soul. The Argentine tango allows the dancer a lot of space for improvising and creating the dance according to his mood. The Finnish tango, on the other hand, is very straightforward. It's more like taking a walk. Especially during the summer, the Finns go crazy about Lavatansid, a dance on wooden floor with the whole village on its feet. The Finns seem to be addicted to tango. The Finnish tango is full of longing. It erupts from human depths. Nature is very calming, and the Finns have always had a close connection to nature. They long for the forests where they originally came from. It's their source of strength. The tango requires good stamina, and it is hard on the knees. Laila exercises each day. Preferably right by the sea. I like opening and bending exercises. They help my body get smooth, warm and comfortable. Afterwards, each dance goes amazingly well from the first step. The Finns are very emotional people. And by dancing tango, they can express their feelings, communicate with their partners, without having to say anything.
From Kaskinen, the journey leads us to the mouth of the river Kokomenjoki. The river drains the seas in the west of Finland. Near the city of Pori, at the mouth of the Gulf of Bothnia, one of Scandinavia's biggest river deltas emerged. This paradise is getting bigger by the day. The sand that is carried along by the water deposits itself here and lets the land advance by about 30 metres into the sea each year. A few kilometres further along, the white beaches of Uteri extend. With a length of six kilometres, they are unique in Finland. A popular spot where the Finns come to enjoy the short summer time. Thanks to the shallow waters and good wind conditions, Uteri is a popular place among wind and kite surfers. On a farm close by, preparations are underway for an original Finnish tradition. Just before midsummer night, Hannu invites his fellow students over for some serious sweating in his mobile sauna. The sauna is simply a part of student life. As we have parties everywhere, we need a sauna that we can take with us to the market square, holiday home, anywhere. The sauna always has to come. Finnish life revolves around the sauna. In the past, babies were even born in it, in rural areas. It was simply the most germ-free place. And on the castles in early history, it was customary to heat the sauna to honour welcome guests. As is the case with Hanu, it is a common practice for Finns to invite guests into their homes for some sweating. In the same way, other Europeans invite people over for a three-course meal. The transport of the sauna to the beach causes disruption in the whole region. At a snail's pace, Hanu travels the 30 kilometers, and it takes him three hours to reach his destination, where his college friends have already emptied more than one load of beer. When the sauna is warm, you can already start preparing by getting changed and getting yourself settled on the bench. Men and women often go separately, but in Finland most saunas are mixed, and beer is simply a part of the ritual. Throughout Finland there are almost two million saunas, so in absolute terms, Three Finns always share a sweat lodge. The Finnish sauna is world famous and exceptionally warm. The word sauna originates from Lapish and means as much as snow or earth pit. Precisely these pits are considered to be the beginning of the sauna culture. At 90 degrees, you are already sweating after only a couple of minutes. Hanu and his friends want to make it up to six hours here today. You won't find sex, drugs and rock and roll in Pori. In Hanu's cabin, bathing clothes preserve the modesty of the sweating companions. Time flies when you're having one sauna round after the other, in between pouring water over the hot rocks and the cooling off outside, over and over again. The next round includes a beating with birch branches. This stimulates the circulation. 
In Finland, you can even buy these sauna supplies deep frozen in the supermarket. I don't think anyone else is as crazy about saunas as us Finns. Saunas are soothing in every situation, no matter if you feel good or bad. It is a tradition that will never die out. It is midnight and the sky is still bright. The time of the white nights. Tomorrow is the shortest night of the year, midsummer. In Finland, there are more boats than there are residents in the capital Helsinki. The best time to sail is from mid-June to mid-August. One could paddle for weeks without setting foot on land. And indeed, the best way to explore the coasts is from the water. In Finland, no one has to worry about trespassing. The so-called everybody's right is law here. Everyone can roam freely through nature, on condition that you treat it well. Fifty kilometers to the south, enormous electricity pylons mark the countryside. They lead to one of two Finnish nuclear power plants. In Finland, nuclear energy is as accepted as it is in France. Even the most remote cabin is quite naturally powered by nuclear energy. Today, fireman Janakartunen is on a special mission during the midsummer festivities. Midsummer is a flag flying day in Finland. The national colours are hoisted at each house. All around the Baltic Sea, special celebrations mark the shortest night of the year. Each country celebrates midsummer a little differently. The Finns are fond of big fires. In Pori, it is Jana's job to take care of the preparations for the event. Midsummer is a family celebration. I came to know it as a child, and that is how I will pass it on to my children. We Finns are quiet, shy and not very outspoken in comparison to the people in Central Europe. We work a lot these days, but when midsummer comes, we finally get to celebrate. It is 11 p.m. and it still won't be dark for another hour. Jana brings his children's twigs to the fireplace in the river and checks if everything is in order. After all, everything must go according to plan at the crucial moment. The Romans in their time also celebrated Midsummer Night with their families. The origins of this celebration reach back to the Stone Age. It may be the oldest festivity of humanity. In Finland, normal life has come to a standstill. On midsummer, the shops close at midday. Every hour, the spirits rise a little higher. It is wonderful being entitled to light the fire. Thousands of people are watching you very precisely at this moment. Midsummer is as important to us as Christmas is. The importance of the celebration is marked by the fact 
that the whole nation is standing still on this day. Happy Midsummer. The journey continues from Pori across the Scary Isles to Hankel. The Scaries in Finland southwest. Over 30,000 islands lie close together here. Nowhere in Europe can so many islands be found in one spot. Every single one of these islands has a murky, a summer house. The house by the water is a Finnish classic, just like the tango and the sauna. The summers are short, in exchange the days are longer. A lot of Finns take their holiday around that time to fully enjoy the light and the rare warmth. Although even during the summer, the water temperature doesn't exceed 17 degrees. This very special world of scaries is where Dr. Jana Kastrin grew up. His grandfather, a doctor himself, already called this place his home. Jana Kastrin specializes in cancer, but he gave up his position as a researcher at the university in order to become a general practitioner. During the winter, he lives and works in Helsinki. In summer, he relocates to the scaries. Since 2003, Jana Kastrin has been sailing through the Skerries as a swimming doctor. The residents are happy that he takes this long and sometimes difficult route upon him. Before he offered his services here, a doctor came to one of the big islands, and only once a week. The work is a real challenge. Something like this could never be found on the mainland. I always say it's a cross between being a doctor and James Bond. James Bond, His speedboat manages 40 knots per hour. He bought it himself. As the distances are quite long out here, he has only six patients a day. No wonder that his rounds are not very cheap. But healthcare pays for the Scary Doc 007. His next call, a patient has asked him to come by as he has strong pains in his shoulder. Jana Kastrin already knows him from previous visits. Ben Flander, previously a press officer for a big car manufacturer, lives together with his wife and dog Rusty on the island Jemholmen. 30 years ago, the 63-year-old built himself a sauna here. Today, there is a big house on the island in which he lives from spring to autumn.
Jana makes time for every one of his patients, even if it is about private matters. Over the years, he has gotten to know everybody up close and personal and learned about their illnesses. The people who live in the Skerries are experienced and patient. They are used to solve problems on their own, even in difficult situations. His patient had a tick bite, a possible reason for his pain. The little animals are widespread here in the Skerries. Ticks can carry malicious viruses that can cause meningitis and joint pains. Jana takes a blood sample from his patient. Okay. Jana's swimming laboratory is equipped according to all the medical standards. After a few minutes, the test shows the first result. Suspicion of Borreliosis. It seems that the patient will have to leave the island and go to a clinic on the mainland. In general, you can say that the people are very grateful. This emergency unit is one of a kind. Eastbound, the Christina Braha. During World War II, she chased submarines off the shore of Gibraltar. Nowadays, the steamboat sets out for excursions through the Skerries. Turku, in Finland's oldest city, the world's largest cruise ship is being built for over 1 billion euros on the STX shipyard. The allure of the seas offers space for 6,400 passengers. With its own central park and an ice skating track, it will soon be sailing its guests through the Caribbean. Ship traffic has a long tradition in Finland that goes back to the Vikings. Time and again, undiscovered traces of old times are found. On an island near Hankor, stones tell stories of mighty men and great seafarers. Helena Taskinen examines rock engravings to reveal their secrets. The island of Hauansuoli is a unique place in the Baltic Sea region. You can still feel the past centuries and the traces that they've left behind. This was a very important place for seafarers. The rock engravings tell the story of the troubled centuries that have preceded our time. They describe decisions made by various kings and how they engaged their troops. This crest originates from Klaus Fleming. At the end of the 16th century, he was one of the most influential men in Finland. He dominated the whole country. Helena Taskinen uses a simple method for copying inscriptions, tracing with carbon paper 
is more precise than any photograph. History was documented on stone as a way to pass the time. The authors were stranded on the island in bad weather. At some point, one of them began to carve his crest along with a date into the granite. And over 600 followed suit, especially officers and nobles who wanted to immortalise themselves. That so many had to sit it out on the island has to do with its location. The most important trade routes of the north crossed paths here. And Helena has now made this special chapter of coast history her mission. The parts of history that have been left to us are not our property, but it is our duty to preserve them for future generations. This is important so that they can get to know about it and explore history just as we are doing now. The route continues from Hanko up to the Russian border to Kortka. Finland, the land of forests. 75% of the country is covered by the green gold. It makes the paper industry an important branch of trade. The Finnish lumbers are of a special quality. In the cold winters, they only grow slowly. As a result, the wood is strong and durable and is ideal for building furniture. Hardly recognizable on this clearing, a cow moose with her offspring who live in these forests. The moose is Finland's largest wild animal. Fully grown animals like this lady weigh up to 600 kilos. Nature has had a deep impact on the people. Each male fin is born as an angler. Yamo Rapala is convinced of this fact. The thing that makes fishing so fascinating is that the fish is the one who decides. You can't control it and that's why we constantly have to search for new tricks of how to get the fish to bite. Already his grandfather Lauri manufactured bait and made it world famous. Every angler knows the rapala. Yamo retired from the family business. He wanted to go back to his roots. One day I realized that, in my heart, I felt much more like a fisherman than like a businessman. It was time to let go of the business world and start doing what I really wanted to do. Make bait by hand the traditional way. To make his bait, Yama only uses material and tools which already his grandfather used. Everything begins with a piece of balsa wood. No machine can make as good a bait as the combined work of the human eye and hand. An important moment in bait preparation is when the bait's eye is painted on and it comes to life. Each piece is one of a kind and is signed by Yamo personally. The king of bait, 
sells them for 100 euros each. The bait should move as if it was alive in order to tempt predatory fish to bite. It mustn't swim like a robot or a piece of dead wood, but should move in a way little fish do. Of course, the most wonderful thing for a bait manufacturer is when he manages to catch a fish with his own bait. But maybe it's even more wonderful when somebody else catches a fish with your bait. But baiting is not the only way the Finns catch their fish. Antti Pekka Kangas prefers underwater hunting, eye to eye with his prey. Rocks in the water are his best fishing grounds. The fascinating thing about fishing with a harpoon is the silence underwater and the solitude that awaits you there. In contrast to the silence is my strained composure while trying to catch a fish and to harpoon him underwater. Antti has gone diving for as long as he can remember. Already as a little boy, the underwater world fascinated him more than life on land. On his underwater mission, Antti dives without any aids. Every two minutes, he rises to the surface to fill his lungs with oxygen. When a fish approaches the spare fisherman, time stands still. The shot at the fish has to be perfect. You only have one try. For Antti, spare fishing is an art. Others think it is barbaric. For the fish, it means a quick death. Water is the most important element in Antti's life. If he could, he would spend his whole day in the water. When he isn't chasing fish, he is in pursuit of the ball. Underwater rugby is a very challenging sport. Many people are afraid of battling it out underwater. Six aside, the players have 15 minutes to manoeuvre the ball into a metal basket as many times as possible. The goalkeeper is allowed to block the basket, at least until the next time he comes up for air. I simply enjoy it when my opponent loses control over the ball. It is hard to say where this passion for diving comes from, but the feeling of freedom underwater is so overwhelming and it has a strong attraction to me. Two women are also taking part in the game. Anything goes, except for biting, scratching and choking.
However tough the battle underwater is, at the end of the day, Auntie throws a fish on the barbecue for everyone. Of course, caught by himself. The last leg of the journey takes us from Kotka to the capital Helsinki, called the Daughter of the Baltic. The sea is the lifeline of the city. The cathedral, the city's landmark. In 1855, it was built on a big pedestal, so it would be visible from all over the city. A bit further along, Rietalachti, the city's most popular flea market. On mild summer evenings, Bargain hunters stroll here under the midsummer sun. Helsinki was under the rule of many different nations. The Ospensky Cathedral was once the symbol of the Russian rulers. Today, it is Western Europe's largest Orthodox church. Right next door, one of the world's most expensive yachts is waiting for customers. For 30,000 euros rent today, it is equipped with a fitness center and a helipad. Just outside Helsinki, excavators are in continuous service in order to make room for a new harbour site. Helsinki has three ports. In the west port, ferries to Estonia lie on the quay. With six departures a day, they are a floating bridge to the country 80 kilometres across the water. At six o'clock in the morning, Ulrika Bachier's shift begins. Everything that goes onto the car deck is our responsibility. Up to 2,000 passengers and 450 vehicles leave the ferry. The loading decks are two kilometers long. I supervise the cargo and get the right people on the right ferry and to the right terminal. The biggest challenges are the hectic days, when there is a lot going on, and then it's all stations go. Ulrika has only one and a half hours to make sure that 400 cars and 50 lorries are safely on board. Today, the Christian gospel riders hope for some space in the ferry's belly. But for now, the holy mission ends in the parking lane. Length and weight of the load have to be constantly matched with the ship officer. Each vehicle has to stand in the right spot. Usually there are more people than there is space on board. But basically anything can happen. For example, on several occasions a car suddenly burst into flames. The gospel riders are on their way to an orphanage in the east of Estonia. The children there are waiting for the toys they are carrying in their luggage. They are lucky. There is still some room in front of the lorries. Okay, yep. Tattoos are something Ulrika and the bikers have in common. For her, they are part of the other Ulrika. When I have my week off, I have time to do the things I want to and do what I enjoy. Then Ulrika turns into Cherry Delicious. I have always enjoyed decorating myself in different ways. As a little girl, I always wanted to dress up as a princess and wear Indian jewelry. Together with her friends, Ulrika performs as a burlesque dancer in a dance club, the Itty Bitty Tease Cabaret. Today, they are rehearsing for the performance.
if her colleagues could see her now. Meanwhile, the ferry with the Gospel Riders heads out into the Baltic Sea and in only two hours it will reach Estonia. <laughs>